It is maddening for everyone else. It is an epidemic, texting while walking. Because I don't use my cell phone when I'm driving. Even though my family does, it leaves me all alone. Enough! Right, there, there's a point where you just say, enough! Even of good stuff. We go, enough, enough, enough. We talked last week about how enough stuff. That we, live in a, we live in a culture where we can look at people around us and go, oh, they have more than I do. But if you look at the whole global family, the whole world, most of us, we got enough stuff. And, and we had a couple boxes up here last week. If you weren't here last week, go online and watch the sermon. We had a couple boxes up here. And I talked about how if you have a box of other, other people's stuff and you, if you're spending your time looking in their box, what do they have? Oh, I don't have that. You, you lose focus on the goodness of what you have. We talked about it. Don't spend your days looking at other people's box and their stuff. And really, in some ways, don't spend every moment looking at your stuff because your stuff doesn't define you. But we talked about how what we need to really do is, is to look at the hands of the God who made us, the God who loves us, the God who, who, who watches us. Hang on a second. Second. <laughs> okay, sorry, what was I saying? <laughs> hands, of, hand, hands of God, think, hands of God. Keep, uh, keep your focus on the hands of God. And this week, we're going to shift from talking about enough stuff to enough distractions. And we live in a world with lots of, I mean, all, all of history, there's tons of, lots of things that could pull your mind and your eye off what matters the most. But, but in our culture, in our day, we now have this multiplication of new potential distractions, of media, of technology, of, of these kind of digital distractions that can kind of take our minds off of, you know, like you'll be in the middle of doing something and, and they're just pop, popping up and you just can't, you know, just like there's no end. Hang on a second. Yes, Kevin? Yeah, nothing really. Um, yeah, I'm at church. Yeah, I'm at church. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I'm, I'm actually preaching. Yeah, no. No, th they'll be fine. Um, yeah, wait, hang on, hang on a second. This is Kevin. Yeah. Enough! Right? You got the point, right? It just, it just floods in. I mean, this, this right here, this is my pyramid of power right here. I got my laptop, my tablet, and my phone. I mean, I got access to everything in the world right here in my two hands. And I want to be very clear about something. Uh, today, as we talk about enough distractions, we're going to focus on the new distractions. The stuff that's been around a long, long time, it's there, and we got to deal with those. But we're going to focus on technology, media, the flood of stuff coming our way. And I want to be absolutely crystal clear. We, I am not anti-technology. I have a laptop. I have a tablet. I have a phone. I use all of them every day. My dad was on the front end. My dad was a computer graphics designer and inventor on the front end of technology. I've been in this my whole life, and technology can be an amazing gift. If I want to get, have a meeting with 10 people, I can send out an invitation. They can click yes, yes, yes. It populates on our calendars. We have reminders. It's amazing. I have one of the most powerful Bible programs known, and when I prepare sermons, I can go there and look in commentaries and books. I can click on one word. It'll give me the Greek, the Hebrew, the Aramaic, the back. It's amazing. I love technology. I'm not, I'm not anti-technology. I don't think God is anti-technology. But God does want us to keep what matters most in the focus of our lives. And when our technology distracts us, a good gift becomes a problem. It, it, it's, like, it's like fire. Fire. If I have fire, we have, we have a gas range in our home, so if I have fire on the stove and I'm cooking something, it's a great gift. If I have fire in my fireplace, it's wonderful and cozy. If that same fire on my stove jumps over and catches the curtains and starts to burn my house down, that same good gift has now become very dangerous because it's out of its proper boundaries. If, if an ember, if there's a pop in my fireplace and the ember flies out and lands on the carpet and I don't notice it and it starts a fire, 
I am now dealing with my house burning down, and that same good gift in the right parameters is now extremely dangerous. That's technology. There are wonderful, amazing, good gifts, and there's potential problems if we don't know how to kind of contain it. And so we're going to be thinking today about what does it look like to, to beware of all those distractions that do come our way, that will come our way if we're not careful. And the foundation of what I want to think about is found in Matthew chapter 22. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. We'll have it on the screen also. But in Matthew 22, Jesus is talking to the religious leaders of his day, and they are trying to trap him. They're trying to corner him. They're trying to catch him doing something wrong and saying something wrong. So they're asking difficult questions. They're trying to challenge him, and he's bringing truth in the midst of their darkness. And in verse 34 of Matthew 22, we read this. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, one of the religious groups that was trying to trap him, Then the Pharisees, another religious group that was trying to trap him, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested Jesus, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in all of the law? What's the greatest commandment? Now, he was wanting Jesus to say something wrong to trap him because they actually wanted to have him killed. They wanted to execute him. They couldn't trap him, so they finally just killed him anyways. But they were trying to get him to say something wrong. But listen to Jesus' response in verse 37. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first, it's the greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Jesus, what's most important? And Jesus said, it's simple. Love God. Have a loving, growing, dynamic relationship with the living God. And love your neighbor as yourself. I love it. It kind of makes the cross. Love God, love people, right? He says, that's what matters most. Get that right. And when anything gets in the way of that, it's a problem. It's a distraction that's too big. And and, and what what I'm learning in my own life, I think what scientists are learning, is that that the, the influx of media and technology and the accessibility of so much all the time can start to consume us and impact us in ways that aren't always healthy and helpful. And so if you're a follower of Jesus or if you're considering becoming a follower of Jesus, it's important to say, what are those big things that can pull me away from what matters most? And say, they may be good things, but I better learn how to corral them. I better learn how to limit them so that I can leverage them for good things. You know, right now, technology, during this service, this is being live streamed. And we have people, Christians, all over the world Put people that have been here as part of our military that are scattered all over the globe. They're, part, they're worshiping with us right now. That's technology. That's a gift. But also, if it's out of control, like many good gifts, it can become a problem. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, as we dig into your word today, we pray, pray that out of this time together, we will love you, God, more and more with all our heart, soul, mind, and our strength. And we pray that as we're together and learn to remove distractions, that we will love each other better that husbands and wives will love each other better, that families will love each other better, that friends will look eye to eye and heart to heart and share life in a deeper way together. Oh, Lord, meet with us and speak to us, Lord. Let us be thankful for the gifts and the good parts of technology, but let us also put boundaries that will make those good gifts good and not let them become something that burns our lives and our relationships and even our walk with you. Speak your truth to us this day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So this good gift... Uh, can become a problem. And people are beginning to write about this. There's two books that we have available after the service. uh, These are books, and actually Pastor Nate, our pastor at Pacific Grove, uh, did study on this sermon, did a lot of the work on this sermon, and and actually preached at one time at another church, and we worked on it together to shape it for Shoreline here. But this book, Right Click and the TechWise Family, we have copies of this available out in the the lobby after the service. If you want to pick one of those up and buy one of those, if you want to dig into this topic more. But that's helped us resources for this series. Also, we have copies of this book, Satisfied, written by Jeff Mannion, who's a good friend of Shoreline Church and preaches here every year, and this is about how to live a life where you're satisfied and content with what you have, another resource we have for you there. And then the last thing I want to mention is a book called Deep Work. Uh, This book has had a huge impact on me. Uh, Cal Newport, he has two PhDs from MIT, smart guy. Uh, He's not coming from a a faith standpoint, but he looks at how our brains and our minds are being fragmented and how we're being affected by the influx of all this technology. And if we don't corral it and we don't limit it, it can really damage us. What scientists are learning right now is that uh, that our, our brains, which are somewhat flexible, our brains can be rewired uh, from the way God's designed them in ways that are damaging. Our brains can be fragmented and fractured. 
And what's happening is a lot of people, people that are so involved in technology in the sense of that, they ha- that every minute, three minutes, five minutes, there, there's a beep, a buzz, there's a stop. They can't have a conversation without taking a break, taking a break, taking a break. They can't read a book or they can't, you know, they can't stay focused. It's, their brains are being rewired and the neural pathways are being reshaped by the way we're consuming technology. And we can actually reshape them the other way in a positive way too, but we need to be aware of that. And so some people that aren't from a faith background, but they just are thinking about how the human mind works are noticing these things and seeing these things. Uh, if you want to think, you know, what, you know, what, if you, what is technology? We need to be technology. It's interesting. One person, Alan Kay, defined technology this way. Technology is anything that was invented after you were born. <laughs> if it seems new, oh, that's, that's that, those newfangled technology. But... but but technology is, is, is new ways of gathering data, of enjoying data, of sharing data. And, 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 and these devices right here, what's interesting is, is with these three devices, I can open up a doorway to the most beautiful things in the world. I can put in sunrise or sunset images. And I can sit for hours and look at absolute beauty that I may never be able to go and see. I can do a search for a couple other kinds of words and find all kinds of garbage and junk. And, and the same conduit comes all... And, and I don't think that the fact that you can get junk through something means it's no good. You just have to have wisdom and boundaries. And, and so what we have to understand is that the way that God has made us and the way that God has wired our brains and our hearts and our souls is such that we have to be careful because things can begin to distract us. And at the end of the day, what God cares about most for you, what God cares about most for you is that you would know that he loves you and that you would love him back with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And if something gets in the way of that, it's a problem. It's a distraction. And also, God wants you to, to understand that he's made you for relationship. And that our relational worlds are getting inundated with technology where people aren't looking face-to-face at each other anymore. People are looking at monitors and screens where people aren't having extended conversations where they look at another human being and talk over time, but there's a break and a break and a break and a break because you kind of laugh you know, during a sermon. No pastor's going to stop and pick up their phone, but we're about there. I mean, in, in most of... You know, I said, well, no, no, no couple's going to be on a date together and stop 15 times during their date to check their phones, are they? We're there. It's, 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 that, that's normative in our culture. The things you, well, that wouldn't, so our relationships with each other and with God can be supported and helped through good things and through good technology, but they can be harmed through a misuse of those things. In the book Right Click, one of the tools that's being used, that's being, we're selling here, one of the books that's a good resource if you may want to dig into it, uh, there's some insights about kind of cognitive concerns, concerns about what we're doing with our thinking and understanding our brain and how our brain works. So here's one thing that, 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 we, that, that scientists are learning. The brain finds high-tech gadgets rewarding. Our brains like this stuff. Our brains like, you know, techie stuff and gadgets. And, and that's not bad or wrong, but just understand your, your brain can gravitate towards those things and you have to be careful that you don't let those things overconsume your thinking. Also, the brain hates to be bored. Our brains are looking for something to do. And we used to fill that time with conversations, like face-to-face with people. We used to fill that time with different activities. And now, I mean, if you're standing at line in a store and you look, there's three people in front of you and go, I'm going to be here for like 90 seconds. It's like, okay, I'm going to do something. You know? And it's, it's like we have to... We have to Fill our brain with something. I, the other day I was thinking about, I was thinking about uh, consuming technology and, and the, the tool, the, uh, think about YouTube. I like YouTube. As a matter of fact, um, when I start my day at my desk, I open up YouTube and I go to some worship songs and I have a worship mix and I click on it and I put it in the top left of my screen. It's going to make it small. And I have that worship music there going through most of the day. And I got kind of worship music and I don't put on a radio. I just put on YouTube and, it, and I, I've got a version where you don't get any commercials. I pay a little bit per year. I get no commercials. Uh, and so I, I put that there. And that's a good tool. But I was actually open my YouTube set because I know what YouTube does is it figures out what you like and what you view and then it tells you, oh, how about this and how about this and how about this? So if you go on my YouTube channel, you're going to find four things. It's going to say, hey, Kevin. It doesn't say it out loud, but it's going to say, hey, Kevin, here, here's a whole row of stuff you might like. And so here's what I found. When I opened up my computer to go to YouTube, I was like, well, what, what does it say I like? Kevin likes worship music. There's a couple of rows of that. Kevin likes golf stuff. There's different golf things. Kevin likes speeches. I listen to speeches, good and bad. I love to hear how people communicate and learn from people giving speeches, so I watch a lot of speeches. And, and, Kevin, and Kevin likes comedy. I like funny stuff. So as, so as I'm getting ready for this, this is really true, as I'm getting ready for this sermon, and I open up YouTube, and I'm writing down, okay, here's the things that it says I'm interested in. I notice in my row of golf stuff, it says golfing outbursts. And it shows a golfer throwing a golf club in a lake. So I, that's interesting. My brain likes, doesn't like to be bored, so I click on that. 
And I, and I, so like five or six, I didn't even realize, five or six minutes later, I'm like, I'm watching Sergio Garcia hook, a, hook an iron into a pond and throw the club, he was younger at this time, throw the, his iron in the pond. And I, all of a sudden I go, what am I doing? I'm supposed to be working on my sermon. <laughs> and I'm watching outbursts of anger on the golf course. And if I wasn't careful, I could have gone from that to that to that and been there for four hours. Because the brain doesn't want to be bored and we can fill it with stuff. Now, I, I enjoy using YouTube for worship music and looking at comedy and speeches and that kind of stuff. But all of a sudden, I'm now walking down a road I don't mean to walk down. And I, and I, I had to go, okay, click this off. I, stop it, Kevin. Pull back. But, but, but our brains are drawn towards those things. High-tech gadgets encourage us to multitask. This is part of what's being learned as people study the brain and technology. And, and many people today think, oh, I'm a great multitasker. But all studies would show, no, you're not. We're not made to multitask. We're made to focus. That's why this book, Deep Work, he talks about how we're not, we're, people aren't even able to work and stay focused for a half an hour, an hour anymore because they're used to fragmenting their thinking every few minutes with some other piece of stimulus, or, and we can't even focus anymore. So we're not learning to multitask, we're actually fragmenting our brains and not being able to focus well. And so there's things that are being learned. And then, interestingly, the, the light, the glow of high-tech devices disrupts our natural sleep cycle. So if you're laying in bed at night with your tablet or your computer on your belly or your, or your large oversized phone, you know, and you're sitting there watching stuff and you fall asleep, you know, kind of drooling on your, on your tablet because, you know, they're in the glow of the, the, the thing in your face, you know, so you're saying that, that's not conducive to good sleep. So just be aware that you're actually the, the, the physiology of the light and the glow isn't helping you. And so if you're falling asleep to devices, that in and of itself might be a concern in terms of, I can't figure out why I'm not sleeping well. That, there may be a connection there. Um, Technology, again, it can be a gift. Uh, the, the influx of media can be a gift if it's the right stuff. But we also have to understand how it can fragment and how it can harm us. Uh, and, and so technology can impact us relationally. Relationally. You know, there's viral versus real relationships. And people are studying the differences between these because now there's people that say, oh, I have a thousand friends. I have a thousand friends. All over the world I have friends. And when you're sick, do any of them come see you in the hospital? When it's two in the morning, you're stuck at an airport. Who drives and picks you up? All of a sudden, you don't have a thousand friends. You go, I don't know if I have one friend. Because you know, there's, there's, there, there's virtual, and then there's real relationships. And so again, uh, uh, looking at this, there's a, there's a difference. Here's the big difference between virtual and real relationships. These three things. Time, effort, and energy. Real relationships take time to invest in them. Real relationships take effort. You have to work at them. Can I get an amen? Yeah. Anybody married? Anybody have friends? Real relationships, it takes effort. Real relationships cost you something. There's energy that's expended. When you pour into another person, raising a child, building a marriage, it takes something out of you. But, but virtual relationships, click, 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 send. And I just sent a dozen or a hundred or a thousand people my thoughts, my pictures, my reflections. And, they, and they're interacting with me. It's easy, it's simple, it's disconnected. So we're highly connected, but we're also deeply disconnected. We have a thousand friends, but there's nobody who sits and cries with us when we're hurting. There's nobody we'll look at face to face like another human being and share a story with. It, 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 we have to be careful that while we're consuming technology, it doesn't break down the things that matter most, loving God and loving each other. And when technology propels that forward, wonderful, utilize it. When it gets in the way, make a choice to limit it and be cautious of the impact it's having on your life, on your mind, on your emotions, on your faith. It's interesting, too, that uh, in, in the virtual world, it's really easy to criticize. Have you noticed that you, that people are, if you look at any video, underneath it, there's going to be a comments and a conversation that starts. A year, two years ago, a couple of times, I'd read some of this. It, it, go, it gets nasty so fast. It gets mean so fast. I can't even read any of that anymore because it becomes so juvenile, so immature, so polarized, so divisive, so nasty. But you can sit there 2,000 miles away and go, boom, and send your criticism, send your anger, send your venom towards somebody else. And even with email, man, be careful. Pastor Dennis, one of our pastors here who's got a, a degree in counseling and who understands how, how relationships work really, really well, Pastor Dennis tells our staff, listen, before you ever send an email, read it. Slow, think about it. Do I mean to say what I'm saying? Because it's so easy when there's not a human being there, face to face. I, I, I can, if I'm looking face to face at another person, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have just all of a sudden a little more kind. They're smiling. I see their, their, their heart, their life. And I'm going to speak differently than if I'm just looking at a screen going, well, da, 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 send. Right? 
And, and so we, ha- we have to be careful of that. Digital criticism rarely leads to reconciliation or growth because it costs nothing and demands nothing in return. It's just kind of dumping words, not communicating with another person. But we can hurt people deeply if we're not careful. And also studies are showing that there's different risks that are coming to real relationships. That if we're too much in the virtual world uh, and, and, and we don't really understand what we're doing with what we're communicating, it can hurt our real relationships. And here's some things that happen. We feel connected but isolated. Well, I'm connected with all kinds of people because I've got all these digital connections, but I feel alone. I feel isolated. But how can I feel isolated? I've got all these connections, but, but they're, they're, they're not that simple. Have a cup of coffee, have a conversation, laugh together, cry together, share life together. We're, we're start to miss some of those things. We find ourselves hiding behind screens. I, you just look around at a restaurant and watch families sometimes in public settings that are actually looking at screens as much as they're looking at each other. And I think that's, I think that's only going to increase unless we make a conscious choice to say, boy, there's certain settings where I might want to limit my consumption of technology, as, as, as helpful as it might be in certain settings, it may be not helpful in this setting. And then the third thing that's being learned is this, people getting the message but not the meaning. You get that? Get the message but not the meaning. I can communicate something through an email. I can say, I can, I can say in a text, love you, heart, smiley face, heart, squinky eye, send, you know? And I can send that to my wife, and that'll touch her heart, you know it will. But, but, if I, but it's different if I look at my wife, who I love, and I, and I say, Sherry, I love you. I love you with all my heart. I, I can't, there's a tone, there's, there's eyes, there's, there's something in our soul that comes through when you're talking human being to human being, right? And we miss that with this and ascend. And, and so we need to say, that, is there, is, are we losing something here in this loving people and loving God? And then opening the door to real life temptations. Sometimes, sometimes uh, you know, virtual world can open the door to things that leak into our real world that can be very damaging. I've got friends in ministry that have lost their ministry. I have friends that have lost their marriage. I have friends that have lost their families because they started connecting with somebody in, in kind of a, a, a virtual relationship and it kind of leaked into their real world and it, that blew their life up. And so there's things out there, there's great things and there's also things that are very dangerous. I think we also need to understand that spiritually in our relationship with God, if we're not careful, if we don't put boundaries, our technology consumption, our media consumption can so fill our lives, we kind of push God off to the side. If you ask some people, how many hours do you spend in a week watching Netflix versus how many hours a week do you spend reading the Bible and praying? You have people who say, oh, well, I don't watch that much Netflix, maybe four hours a day. Um, and, and that, would be low for some, that would be low for some people, really, it, because it's set, up, it's, it's set up again to when you watch something, well, how about this? Well, how about this? And, and it, it's designed to keep feeding more things and keep your brain entertained. But, but, but to, to look and say, boy, is, is, is what I'm consuming, is the time I'm investing affecting my relationship with God? And I think we can be impacted spiritually. Uh, our, our theology can be shaped, our thinking can be shaped, and particularly the studies are showing that a next generation is having their view of themselves shaped by technology, by social media. When, when a young person looks at another person's life, meaning their Instagram, their, their Snapchat, their Facebook, whatever it is, and, and of course, when people present themselves in the social world on media, they present the perfect picture. Nobody, nobody you know, if, they, if they show, I was in the hospital, right? They show a picture, it's, but now I'm better and I'm victorious, you know? It's, it's always like, it's always the victory story. It's always the good things and, and, and everything's kind of distilled down to the perfect moments of life and people look at that and go, my life will never be that good. Your suicide rates are going up for young people. And some studies are showing that part of it is this sense that my life will never be as good as that presentation. But you know, that person, how they present their life, that's not their real life. They wake up in the morning and their hair's messed up and their breath stinks and they're just a normal person too. But you don't see that. In the, you, don't you don't see that. That's not what's presented. And, and so our souls can be beat up and we can be impacted in, in really deep and painful ways when we're not careful. So here's the question. What would it look like if we leveraged technology and our online experiences to enhance our offline community? If we can use technology, to, yes, to have great entertainment, and yes, to communicate well with people, and yes, to do our work well and, and, and enjoy all those things, but say, but I really want to use my technology to propel me towards loving God well and loving people well. And, and how do we do that? How do we grow in that? I think it begins when we understand who we are. Listen to these words from Genesis chapter 1. This gives a vision of who you are. Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Then God said, 
Let us make mankind in our image. That's the Trinitarian, that God within his Trinity being saying, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so they may rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, over the livestock, all the wild animals, over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God made us in his image. God loves us. God delights in us. And he wants a vibrant relationship with you. Whether you're a longtime Christian, a brand new believer, or you're even just kind of investigating the Christian faith, saying, I don't even know if this is true, but man, if there's a God who loves me, I'd like to know about it. If this Jesus is real, I'd like to know about him. If that's your heart, God says, I want to have a relationship with you. That's his heart. He made you in his image, and he made you for community with him and with others. And so I want to just take this word, uh, tech, uh, and, and I want to use it. And actually, Pastor Nate came up with this as he was working on this message. And, I, and I, just a simple way to kind of remember, how do we tie in kind of good biblical principles with how we consume technology? And probably for some of you, I'll be reminding you of something you already know. You go, I kind of know this, but, but listen to what, what Peter says in 2 Peter 1. He says, so I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly established in the truth you now have. I think it is right to refresh your memory. Sometimes you need to be reminded of things you know. So, Four things, using these letters, T-E-C-H. If you're a note taker, there's a spot in your bulletin uh, to write a couple thoughts on if you want to take a, take a couple notes there to remind you and just get you thinking about this for your own life. But here's the first one, the T. Be wise with your time. Just think about your time use. Is, is, my, is my pyramid of technology and add to this my TV screen, other monitors, is this consuming my time so I'm not having good time with God and good time with people? Listen to, listen to what the Apostle Paul says in the book of Ephesians, chapter 5. Beginning of verse 15, he says this. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men or unwise women, but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. Make the most of your time. Be careful how you're consuming whatever it is that fills your time. And, and if, if entertainment and media, and technology, and games, and social media, and all that is consuming all of your time, and you say, I don't even have space and room to relate with God, much less other people, I'm, th then you probably are consuming too much stuff. And make a decision to put some boundaries on your time so you can make time to connect with God and to connect with people. The E is everything. Everything by prayer. Make sure that prayer permeates everything you do. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, we read this. But do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. If you find it hard to pray, hard to commune with God, say, maybe, maybe I've, I'm getting too tangled up in technology. I know for me, if I want to spend time with God and I want to read the Bible and I want to pray, I have to turn off my stuff and put it away from me. If I got my phone sitting next to me, I can't really have, there's just too much stuff coming in all the time. There's too many things. This isn't making any noise or beeping because it's actually off. <laughs> there's an off switch, by the way. Um, and, but but if, if I'm going to have good time with Jesus and be in the scriptures and really focus, I actually can't do it on my phone or my tablet. I, I, I use, and they still make these. It's just a paper Bible. Um, and I have, to, I have to do this, and I have to have a, I have a journal and a pen to write with. I don't take notes on my devices, and I don't read my Bible on my devices when I'm having my devotional time. When I'm studying for sermons, I do use my devices. But I find that when I'm trying to spend time with Jesus one-on-one, -on -one, I've got to just kind of put that stuff aside in that moment, in that time. And all of a sudden, I get focused time. But if you find your prayer, I'm just not praying much. Why? Because there's always something coming at me. Then say, maybe I can kind of subside those things, push them down a little bit, and spend more time focused on the Lord. The C is the greatest commandment. That's what we've been talking about. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Remember the greatest commandment. If you say, my consumption of media and technology and entertainment, which is so available. I mean, how many channels are there on TV? How many things are available? When you do a search on any topic, there's millions of hits. There's so much. And if I'm, if I'm just saying, listen, you know what? I'm not loving God well, and I'm not loving people well. Ask yourself, is, is maybe part of it that I'm distracted with all this stuff coming in? And grapple with that and think about that and create some limitations for yourself. And then the H of tech is remember that you are God's 
handiwork. You are his artwork. You are his beautiful creation. Ephesians 2.10 says this. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. That word handiwork in the Greek poema, really it means masterpiece. And I want you to look on, look on the screen here. You want, you want to see a masterpiece. Uh, Michelangelo, the Sistine Chapel, is trying to capture this moment when God created humanity and breathed and touched and brought into humanity the breath of life. And this, this master, this, what's cool about that is it's a masterpiece, but it's a picture of the great masterpiece that God made you. And God says, you are my poema. You are my masterpiece. You are beautiful to me. You are precious to me. And this is the bottom line. God says, you're my masterpiece, created to live for Christ Jesus. And whatever gets in the way of that, boy, we gotta learn to push, the, push it back, whatever it is. And sometimes technology is, sometimes that's that thing that gets, I know for me, that can get in the way. That can consume my mind and my thinking and push me away from the things that matter the most. And so I've been thinking and praying about it. I've been kind of doing what I call what ifing. I love to what if. What if I did this? What if I did that? And I, I kind of play with ideas and try to think what would be good for me. And I, I come up with ideas. And I want to give you some what ifs that maybe as you look at your life, if you say, I'm not connecting with God the way I want to. I'm not connecting with people the way I want to. If I'm sitting in front of a TV or in front of a device and people are trying to get my attention, kids and spouse, but I'm just always you know, immersed in this world. How might I pull back a little bit and make more space for really living for God and loving God and loving others? So here's some ideas, some thoughts, and you can jot these down. And, and we're going to sing two songs in just a moment together. While you're singing, while you're worshiping, let the Holy Spirit speak to your heart. And maybe, maybe God just will say to you, Sherry actually during the first song, last service, leaned over and said to me, boy, God just put something on my heart that I need to do to kind of push back some stuff and make more space and push back some of the technology and that, that in my life. I didn't even ask her what it was. She just kind of whispered that to me and I thought, but I think it's gonna happen to a lot of us. Maybe it's already happening. But here's some thoughts. What if you did a tech and media fast? Where you say, I'm just gonna fast from tech and media. None of it at all. For like an hour. Some of you go, oh, it's impossible. An hour. An hour without my baby? You know, okay, I'll fast while I'm sleeping. But sometimes that doesn't even work, right? Um, or maybe a fast for a day. I read a book of a guy who's not a Christian but he was studying how the technology is influencing the brain. He did a 30-day fast from all technology and all me. He shut it all out for 30 days. He said, man, I never felt better. My brain never worked better. He says, now I'm back in it, but I'm back in it with a lot more boundaries. Because I didn't, I didn't realize how much he had taken over my thinking. But it can. How about this? Uh, go low-tech or no-tech on your day off. If you have a job and you have stuff that flows in through your phone. On my day off, I turn off my flow of all stuff coming from Shoreline. If you want me, you've got to come find me. One day a week, I take off. And on that day, um, I actually, because if, if I get my email flowing in, my brain just shifts back into that. You know what I mean? You just shift into that mode where all of a sudden I'm back there. And God says one day a week, cease, desist, rest. So I try to do that. So maybe your day off, you kind of slow down a little bit. Your morning or your, what if in your morning or your evening, you went low tech or no tech? That's what I'm trying, that's my two goals. In my mornings, I'm trying to go no tech. I don't turn any of my devices on. I'm trying to not turn them on at all. I have to get a new alarm because my alarm's on my phone and then it's on and then I touch it and then I look at it and then I read emails and ah, I'm in. So uh, I'm actually gonna get like a, an old-fashioned alarm, um, like, a, like a rooster. No, <laughs> um, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna get like an alarm that I, that I plug in that doesn't have my phone with it. And so and I, what I'm trying to do is until I've spent time praying and reading my Bible and exercising and kind of plan out my day, then I'll turn my stuff on. I'm trying that. I'm gonna see how it goes for a week. And then the evenings, I'm going to try to have a time where I turn everything off and just say, okay, because here's the deal. It'll be there in the morning. And maybe I'll look at my wife. Uh, you know, maybe I'll just do when I have all that stuff turned off. Maybe I'll just look at my wife. But, but I'm, I'm just going to try that. That's, that's something I'm going to try. Um, how about if having spaces and places that are no tech? Say, hey, in our living room or in our dining room. In our dining room. No tech in the dining room. Ooh, what would that look like? The bedroom. How about no tech in the bedroom? You know, these things have cameras and uh, microphones. I'm worried. I sometimes I think, are they, is that, are they listening, whoever they are? Um, I'm, not, I'm not paranoid, I'm just saying. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, maybe the bedroom. We're not going to have our, we're going to leave our stuff out of the bedroom. How about certain times? When I'm at church, if you're using your phone for your Bible and for your notes, that's great. But if you're in church, I mean, I'm not going to be checking my email and stuff during that time. Dinner out with friends. Leave it at home. What about that time? My devotional time, I'm trying that. Not get my tech away from me during that time. What if you limited your email? I only, I'm trying to check email only three times a day. And what I find out is when I stop to check it, it's there. Instead of every time something ping, I actually turned off the ping so I don't hear it, and I'm just trying to check in certain times. Uh, what, what if you limited your social media? 
And he said, I'm not going to consume as much of that. What if you limited your media? What if you said, I'm not going to watch, you know, I, I'm going to watch three hours of Netflix a week instead of four hours a day. Which for some people, four hours, that's all? Um, there's all it just, it feeds, it feeds you know, is your life being consumed by technology? It's a gift, but keep it a gift. I want to pray as the worship team comes forward. And we're going to sing two songs that are going to give space for you to both worship and listen to the Holy Spirit. So let's pray together. Oh God, you have told us the two most important things in all the world are to love you and to love each other. And Lord, when our technology gets in the way of that, we pray you would help us to limit that technology so that we can love you well and receive your love fully and love each other with passion and with care. Lord, help us embrace and be thankful for the good tool that technology is. Lord, I thank you for all the things that, that I'm helped with through technology every single day. But I also pray that I would have the wisdom to set boundaries that I might honor you fully with my life. I pray this for all of us. And will you speak to each one of us if we've crossed the line, if we need to, to, to kind of pare some things back, speak to our hearts. And now as we worship, Lord, hear our hearts. Let us not just sing songs. Let us with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength sing to you and worship you. We pray this in Jesus' name.